So I'm calling the meeting to order. It is 630. That's for the treasurer's for the, for, for the treasurer's benefit. Okay. Um, did all the people who are members, did you put your name in the hat? We got a drawing. She just wanted you to do an op. She wanted to pretend, but I have a drawing tonight. So for something nice and I got a lot of, so maybe get a chance, not just one or two. I got 20. So <laughs> anyway, um, or just, I just got to kill time here where he's finding his program on the computer. Um, let me see. Did I have, a, oh, I can tell you before I get 1 of the things I can tell you before I get to my part of the meeting. Um, we finally got the check from the state. You know, we did a silent auction because, you know, the state meeting was in McAllen. So they had the RGV chapter and our chapter, um, helped out with that. And we had, a, there was a silent auction. And the RGV and I um, worked on that silent auction and people from our chapter and the other chapter donated things. And I think from what I can remember to me, it was a record amount of money that they took in 800 and $8,750. And um, what do we get? We get we get to share. 20%. So the other chapter got 10%. We just got the check. So it took from October last year till now. So we got a check for $875 for our chapter. So it was, that was, that was a good thing. I kept bugging them at the president's meeting. Where's our check? Where's our check? And even Tana before she, um, before she ended her term, one of the president's meetings, she goes, well, we want that money. We, we accounted for it in the budget and we've probably already got it spent. So we want our money. That didn't move them. No, <laughs> I didn't move, but we finally got it. Okay. Are you ready? Jennifer is going to introduce our um, speaker. Hello everyone. Our speaker tonight is Tom Butler, one of our own. And he's going to talk to us tonight about total solar eclipses. We have one coming up on April 8th, which is very exciting. Uh, Tom has been a master naturalist since 2012, and then he transferred over to our chapter when it was newly founded in 2015. He's a retired uh, science educator and veteran. He's been an amateur astronomer since 1991, and he and his wife Louise have seen annular eclipses and total solar eclipses. So he is here to talk to us about this exciting event coming up soon. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we're going to turn down the lights. Does that mess things up for you? No, it's good. No, it's good. Okay. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to be here and I uh, hope that uh, you'll enjoy what I have to say here about the total solar eclipse. Three weeks from now, we're going to see it. It's going to be here in Texas. It'll be here, but it'll be partial here. So we want to talk to you tonight, get you to get in your car and drive a couple hours, three hours away and get to the center line and get to see the thing, hopefully in clear skies, not like what we have tonight. Hello, there we go. Whoops, back up. So start off uh, with a little information about the sun. Uh, you see it every day or most every day. And it looks pretty much the same all the time. And it did for centuries for people. Nobody had an idea what was going on on the sun. If anything, it was just there. Well, we started learning things about the sun uh, actually in the oh in the thousand eleven hundred twelve hundred the chinese started noticing little dots on the sun once in a while how did they do that well you can look at the sun when it's really low on the horizon we've all done it sunset or sunrise and if it's really low on the sky you can look at the sun, you can see that reddish orange disc. And if there's a really big sunspot on it, you might notice it. Some people did. And every once in a while in the literature, ancient literature, you find records of people reporting a, a spot on the sun. Well, there's lots of spots on the sun. 
many of them way too small to see with the naked eye. So they were seeing some unusual things on the sun. I downloaded this from uh, uh, old age is getting me. Uh, the movie channel. What I, I can't think of. YouTube. Thank you. <laughs> That's how often I use YouTube, but when I have to, I can. So we're going off screen here, this screen, and we're going to a YouTube presentation from NASA. This is the Solar Dynamic Observatory, which was launched in 2010. And this is a, year, a 10 year look at the activity of the sun. We're not going to watch all 10 years of it, okay? We're just going to pick some spots here to look at because this is one day every second. And you're seeing the kind of things that go on on the sun. That's quite a show, isn't it? Instead of being something that's just there and stationary and doesn't ever change. Now we're seeing that, oh my goodness, there are all of these crazy things going on on the surface, apparently even affecting the satellite when it was aimed at us here. These are sunspots that we're looking at here. There's lots of them. So these are big groups of sunspots here. There's little individual ones here and there that come and go. Another big group here, another big group. Look at that display right there. I show you this for several reasons. One of them, most important, is the fact that when you look at the total eclipse, when the sun is first being covered by the moon, things that are outside the bright disk can be seen. So you might get to see a prominence, one of those loops that you see out here or some spikes like this, which are flares, that will show up after the moon has covered the whole disk, but before it gets way over it so that you can't see the edges anymore. And then at the end of the eclipse, you can look at the other side as it's just about to be uncovered, and you might see some of this activity again. So that's something to look for during the eclipse. And the other thing that this demonstrates is that if the sun is crazy active like this, we might have a really interesting corona. What we're looking at here, this is the photosphere. The photosphere is the light surface of the sun. It's the bright surface. We can't see anything inside of that. We know very little about what goes on inside the sun, but we can make a lot of suggestions as to what's going on. The sun is made of hydrogen. Hydrogen at high temperature and pressure will fuse together and form helium. That's what happens in an atomic bomb, in a nuclear, in a hydrogen bomb, not the one that, that um, what's his name built? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a uranium bomb. We were splitting atoms. OK, the hydrogen bomb was developed later. It's many times more powerful than a uranium bomb. And the sun is doing that. It is, in fact, a furnace made of its own fuel. The hydrogen in the sun is combining into helium. Over time, the helium will clog up the center of the sun and the reaction will slow down and the sun will progress on. We'll talk about that quickly in a few minutes. But what you're looking at here is basically a big ball of hydrogen with a, with a uh, hydrogen to helium reaction going on in the center. And that's the sun. Well, let's look at it over here. I'm going to skip to the end of this to show you another look at the sun. What do you notice here? It is not real. You don't see those crazy reactions you were looking at before. Something else about the sun, you notice it rotates. It spins on its axis, just like any other object in the solar system or most other objects. But there's no big prominences. There's no big flares. It looks like a boiling pot of oatmeal. 
clearly there's something going on. It's never still or quiet, but there's none of those big eruptions, none of those big spikes, none of those big prominences. So the sun can be very, very active or it can be very, very quiet. Okay, and we're going to drop that down, I think. No, here we go. Get rid of it this way. There we are. Okay, so let's go on. There we go. Um, I, I made mention of the uh, life of our sun. Now I'm, I'm going to be doing the pointing here on the screen. Can everybody see that pointer? Uh, I've enlarged it so it'll show up at, at home for those that are viewing at home. And uh, I'm going to be pointing here because if I point at the screen up there, nobody at home will see it. Okay, so here's the sun right here. This black line represents the main sequence, which is where we find most of the stars in the sky. This is where stars live. They're steady life when they're steadily producing uh, energy. There are stars that are brighter. This is the scale for luminosity here from 10,000 here to one hundredth and one one and one tenth and one one hundredth down here. So very dim stars here, very bright stars up here. This is temperature across the bottom axis here. This is cool stars, 3000 degrees Kelvin, which is Celsius with no negative numbers. So it's just slightly different. Uh, 5000 degrees over to 100,000 degrees over here. And that's surface temperatures. That's what we measure. We say we haven't stuck a thermometer into a star yet. So all we can do is just measure the surface temperature and figure things out from there. So the main sequence is where the sun's going to spend most of its time. Uh, it says 4.5 billion years burning hydrogen. And uh, that's what's behind and what's ahead. And I had a prof in, in uh, when I was doing my master's degree that said, uh, you know, if, if you find something that's right in the middle, and you don't know exactly what's going on. And you happen to, you know, people tell you it's in the middle. It's probably not, you know, the middle is a special place. So it may be closer to the end or closer to the beginning. We don't have a way to really gauge that or pin it down. Still don't. After it finishes its main life, it's off up here to be a red giant for a little while. The time sequence here is 4.5 billion years, 12.2 billion years into the star's life. Now it's a red giant. And notice it doesn't stay there long, 12.3 billion years in its life. It's, a, it's in this horizontal branch here, going to a place up here where it ejects, says it ejects the outer layers. The inside, there's, there's collapse going on, the reaction has quit. The inside gets, gets hot and the star goes poof. All the outer layers of the star are blasted away. They're out into space as a planetary nebula, which will last for 0 0.0305 billion years, just a, a much shorter period of time and that will disperse in space. And the sun then is cooling down and cooling down, but the outside, the exterior is getting, is, is very hot from this explosion. And then it will slowly go dim and begin to cool, end up a, a little crisp remnant after, at the end of its life. We won't see any of that. We'll be gone at the point it departs. When it departs this main sequence here, everything on earth is gonna stop. That's going to be the end. There's there's no fixing that, and there's no place to go really in quantity. So we've kind of written that off. Okay, so sunspots. Here's an example of sunspots on the sun's surface. Uh, there, these these irregular things here are sunspots. That circle right there is labeled Jupiter. So that's the size of the planet Jupiter, the largest one in the solar system. That's the size of Jupiter in relation to the sun, in relation to these sunspots. That little dot right there is labeled Earth. Now, we're tiny, tiny stuff here, you see. It's, it's just a little tiny spot. If you, if you strung Earth together on a string, like beads on a necklace, 
it would take 109 of them to stretch one time through the center of the sun. It would take, if the, earth, if the sun were a fishbowl and you were dropping earths into it, it would take over a million earths to fill the fishbowl. So we're a tiny little crisp out here compared to this big thing. And the sunspots up close, if you look at them, they look like this. This is without all the fancy stuff going on. This is what you see in visible light, or this would be filtered hydrogen, hydrogen alpha light. That's common filter that's used, taking just a tiny piece of the spectrum of the sun. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look at the little ice age. People have always challenged me about astronomy and why it should be part of the TMN program, but it is, of course, the only source of energy for Earth. And what better or what bigger natural resource is there than the sun? Uh, these variations, and you see here, there's there's the earliest naked eye observation, a little green dot here. The little green dots here are all naked eye observations. And they run along here for a while and drop off, and then they see more. And, and part of that may be just nobody's interested, nobody's keeping track, and then somebody gets interested. Oh, they, somebody said there were sun spots on the sun, they start looking for them again. But right around here, we invented the telescope. And then with the telescope, we learned to observe the sun by projecting an image onto a sheet of paper or onto a white surface of some kind. You can't look through the telescope at the sun. And whoever tried it the first time, I feel sorry for them. Anyway, there was a period when there were just no sunspots seen. After we had the telescope, after we were able to make observations, nobody was really watching real close, but we didn't see sunspots for almost 70 years. And during that 70 years, these winters that had been going along fairly warm suddenly became quite cold. This is in the time when this country was being settled. And early in our, our government's history, this little ice age suddenly occurred. The summers were cool. Summer crops would not mature. Winters were harsh and there wasn't enough food to go around. It drove a lot of refugees from Europe to America. Then we started observing sunspots regularly. And the temperature, the number of sunspots varies just like this. It's a toothed line, it goes up and down. We'll come back to that in a minute. I thought I was there. Um, but the number of sunspots does vary. A uh, quick look at the geometry of the eclipse. And this is a diagram. It's, it really, it, it, uh, it's very interesting how this works. Uh, we're looking at the sun, at the, I'm sorry, at the earth here. This is, this circle is the earth. This littler circle is our moon. And the sun is off here somewhere in the distance or at some times of the year off in this direction at some distance. Now the moon's fairly close to the earth. The note down here says that that's the right size for the earth and the right size for the moon relative to each, to each other. But it says this distance is not accurate, it's not, not to scale. So it, you'd have to extend this out 13 times that distance to put the moon the right distance away. The distance it shows here from Earth to Moon, take that times 13, go off the screen, out of the building, and put that little dot for the Moon out there. Now, this line right here is the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic is the Earth's orbit around the Sun. So the Sun is always out there at the end of that line. A plane is a flat surface. The tabletop is a plane. This is not a surface, it's an imaginary flat surface that would connect the Earth's orbit all the way around the sun. And the sun would be in that plane, but not the center. And I've given you some numbers in the handout if you've got it there, the, the side that has the numbers. It tells you how far we are from the sun when we're closest to it and when we're farthest from it. It also lists how far the moon is from us when it's closest to us and when it's farthest away. For the sun, the Earth's aphelion distance would be appropriate, aphelion being the most distant point, 
and perihelion would be the closest point when the moon, when the earth is closest to the sun. Any guesses on when that happens? What time of year when we're closest to the sun? Summer. Winter. Summer. It is winter. It is January. It's shortly after the new year, about January the 10th or 11th, is when we we are at uh, perihelion, our closest point to the sun. So why isn't it warmer? Because it's tilted it away. In this position right here, if the sun was out here on the right side of the screen, the north axis tilted toward it, the sun is overhead here. This dotted line is the Earth's equator. So that the sun comes way up north here because actually the Earth is tilted to make the sun appear higher in the sky. When it's when it's winter time, the sun is below the equator and the sun is overhead here. And for those of us that are up at this latitude, the sun is way down lower in the sky. And that's what makes the difference between the, the seasons. Okay, so backing up just a minute. One of the interesting things that happens, and we have a wonderful example of it here, when the moon goes from this position to this line down here, where it's below the sun in the, in the, when we look at it in the sky, it's lower or it's higher. There's a point where it crosses over here and it's there for a matter of hours in just the right spot to line up with the sun. Sometimes it's too far away. Sometimes it's closer. But the interesting thing is that if you think of this now as a sphere, a ball, we're looking at a circle, but it's it's really a sphere. And on one side, you see this way. And on, from the other side, imagine yourself looking at it from behind the screen. It would flip the thing over and you'd have that crossover point again on the far side of the Earth. These are called eclipse seasons and they'd be about six months apart. So when did we have the last eclipse here? When? October 17th. And the next eclipse is in April, which is six months later. So we're seeing one, one eclipse at the only time we could during that period in, in October. And we're seeing the next one that happens in April back-to-back -back eclipses six months apart. That's the eclipse season, and you're witnessing it here, right here in Texas. That's unusual, so extremely unusual, because it's a big Earth, and that shadow from the moon can go everywhere. I'll show you in a minute. Okay, let's take a look at the corona of the sun. This, this is from a coronagraph. They have a telescope out in uh, uh, New Mexico, um, Kid Peak. In, I'm sorry, that's Arizona, Kid Peak in Arizona, uh, which is solely dedicated to observing the sun, and they, they create an eclipse with that telescope anytime they want. And so they observe the exterior of the uh, uh, sun, the, the corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun, and they can get details we won't see. But this is what it looks like through a, uh, through with the naked eye or with a camera or a telescope. Uh, and you can point a telescope or binoculars at the eclipse sun. But I'm going to give you a question. Get the times for the eclipse. Set an alarm on your phone. Give yourself a good 30 seconds. The alarm goes off. You shut off your phone. And you know it's about time to put those glasses back on. Because you want to have them ready to go. If you are caught and you don't have the glasses in hand. And you see that first blip of light come through, close your eyes as tight as you can, look away, find your eclipse glasses and get them back on before you look at it. There are other ways to view the eclipse, we'll talk about them. Okay, so where's the eclipse going to be? This information came from this book. This is a NASA reference publication. 
Uh, it's it's 50 year canon of solar eclipses. It goes through 2035 and they actually have eclipses beyond that. We'll look at it at some of those later. It's a nice reference for this. And it shows here the circle is the, the size, the actual size of the moon shadow. And the moon shadow will extend as wide as these two lines are right here. And they see a, a circle up here. The circle, when we look at the book later, you'll see some of them become uh, oval in shape. Because remember, we're projecting this shadow onto a sphere. When it gets further around the curve of the sphere, it takes on a different shape. It's not always circular. It comes from the moon as a circle, but when it hits the curved surface of the earth, it will become an oval at times. Okay. This is a, a page out of the book here. And you see these columns here. You don't have to read the numbers. I'm just going to say this is universal time here, Greenwich Mean Time. It's the time in London, England, and we use that for all astronomical events. The military uses it for all their times. It's Zulu time and military, but it's 24 hour clock. It's six hours difference if we're on standard time here in the central time zone. On daylight time, it's five hours, so we have to subtract five hours from these times. We've got the northern limit. That's this line right here. I'm having trouble with my mouse. The, that line would be the northern limit. This line would be the southern limit and gives latitude and longitude of both of them. And then the latitude and longitude of the center line tells you what diameter it would be, how high the sun will be in the sky. The azimuth, that is the direction north, south, east, west, that you look for the sun, how wide the path is here, and how long totality will last. The top of the list here for our eclipse is around two minutes and 6.8 seconds. I'm reading off the screen there. Down at the bottom here, it's two minutes and 4.5 seconds. And here in Texas, right in here, it's 4.26 three seconds four, four, four minutes 23 seconds so we're right in the fat area of the eclipse here this, this is going to last longer for us than people at either end of the eclipse so texas is going to be where people will really really want to be to see this eclipse and people travel louise and i have gone to paris saw the eclipse there we went to uh Lusaka, in Zambia, and we saw the eclipse there with a group, a tour group, and there were several tour groups there at the same time. And we've been to Wyoming 2017 and saw the eclipse there. It's an event, and people will come from everywhere. Now, I'm going to clip on this link right here, take us out again. This is a program available and it's in referenced on your paper there and you've got the paper link but it's of course not active but i did put these out to the uh web mail uh the the list the listserv okay so you go home you've got a listserv message from me and it's got the live links so you can click on them you can get this and i'm going to show you how to use this as quickly as i can right here the path goes up through Texas here, and you can go up here and enter a location. We can put in here San Antonio. Okay, and we'll find out that, oh my gosh, there's all these San Antonios. There's San Antonio, Texas, way down the list there. So San Antonio, Texas, and it's gonna come up here with information about the eclipse, oh, advertisements for glasses. We got to have those. Oh, they've got prices here. I haven't. Last time I clicked this, this I'm, I'm way off base here. Let me. I think you're in Florida. Yeah. So you're in San Antonio, Florida. Was it? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll back up. We'll try again. I thought, you know. It, Okay, there's the list. Here's San Antonio, Texas, right there. Yeah, well, it's coming back the same way here. Same thing. The ad underneath it, and not the city. 
Yeah, I, that entirely possible. Okay, let's let's back out of this. Here's here's the easy way to do this. We're just gonna I'm gonna scroll in closer, just zooming into this. Okay, and here's Austin right there. He's, you can zoom in. You see, keeps making it smaller again. But there's Austin. Now Austin is right on this line, the southern limit line. If you're over here in Austin, you're partial eclipse. If you're over here in Austin, you've got a total eclipse. So I'm clicking there, and it can give me information on the eclipse uh, simulator here, or you can go get data, and both are useful. The simulator looks like this. I, I agree. We'll do this. There's the sky. That's the sun. Over here is a slider. I can grab this little thing and I can make the sun bigger so we can really see it. Down here are time scales. I can adjust the thing and I can look at it real time 1.0x one, one, one time, or I can speed that up and make it four times faster. Uh, grab, grab this dot. It's avoiding me. There we go. There's 34 times faster, so we can make the whole eclipse go fast. Or just for tonight, I'm going to grab, well, anytime you can do this, I'm going to grab this dot here and see I can make it go where I want to. And you see it's this direction coming. You see the S going across. We're looking directly south. And bang, just like that, we've got the corona. Okay, and we go across and bang, we've got the sun. See it there? Just a little little bit of it showing up. So the eclipse there lasts only a short period of time because where I placed us was right on the edge of that line. Let's go back to San Antonio, zoom in here, find San Antonio right there. Let's go to the, the center line here. And let's do the same thing. Now, it, it tells you somewhere here the length of time of the eclipse, or I thought it did, maybe in the, the other data. But uh, starting here now, make the sun bigger. There we go. And run the eclipse here. Now we get the eclipse. And now we go a pretty good distance on here, you see, before the eclipse ends. So it makes a big difference whether you're on the center line or you're out at the edge of that line where the shadow will be. And by the way, look up here. You see the shadow map here? This, backing it up, you can see the shadow moving across the map. So you can see when it re reach, reaches this red dot right there. That should be the shadow moving over the sun, the sun. and uh, that's that's uh, and then we move the shadow right on off, and the eclipse ends. Okay, so that's that's available. There's also with this. Let me back out of this and go to the um, city search again. And did I spell it right? I did. San Antonio, Texas. There we are, right there. Okay. Now uh, we can go to the city page, which is different. That's what I was looking for before. Is this? And down here at the bottom of the city page, it has a little map here of the city, and shows where that line is. But it also shows the central daylight time, the beginning of the eclipse, and the end of the eclipse, or mid eclipse. I'm sorry, that's mid eclipse. And then you can calculate out what what the end would be because it doesn't give that. It gives me here three colon zero zero, which is not a time. It's a reference to where the moon will make contact, first contact with the sun. That's where you're going to see the moon first show up on the sun at three o'clock. This is like, you know, 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock. 
Okay, so you're looking at the sun, you're looking at the right side of the sun about where the clock would be at three o'clock. And that's where you should see the moon start to move into the sun in San Antonio as the eclipse begins. So that, that information is useful. It's a different kind of page than what we had before. And you can run this, this diagram here. It's running, self-running, but you can run it right there and run through the eclipse quickly there as well. So you've got a reference for that in the handout there and online waiting for you at home. So let's now move on to the next slide. Yeah, come on. Mm. I, I no, I'm I'm still on the internet. Pardon me. I don't know where I am or what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> so safe observing. Most of you, if you were involved in the eclipse last time, you know this. You have to have the solar glasses. If you don't have them already, you can order them. They're still available on some of those sites listed there. There's also another site that you can go to that's on the uh, handout the American Astronomical Society, if you go to that location, they'll give you a hundred places that are selling eclipse, uh, eclipse glasses, some of them online, some of them in store. And so you can, you know, some way, somehow, you've got three weeks to get glasses if you don't have, it didn't save them from last year. And if they got scratched up, they're not usable. When the moon completely covers the sun, the glasses come off and you can stand there with your naked eye and look at that eclipse. My impression, the first time I saw this, every time I've seen it, is like somebody pulled a cork out of the sky and it's just a black hole like you're looking out into space. You're really not. What you're actually seeing is the new moon. You can never see a new moon except during a total solar eclipse. That's the new moon. That's the phase it's in. And two weeks from that We'll have full moon just about a week from now. When the moon completely covers the sun, the glasses come off. Uh, as it re reappears, you have to put the glasses back on. Pointing any camera at the sun before or after totality will burn an image of the sun into the camera's sensor. Your phone, your if you have a, a camera, a regular camera, if you set it up and you pointed it at the sun to take the eclipse pictures, You've got to point it away before the eclipse ends, or you'll have a little dot where the sun burned a, a burned an image into the CCD sensor. Is just not it's too sensitive to have full sunlight on it. Question. I say I took my eclipse, eclipse glasses, put them in front of the camera, and took the pictures, and there was no problem. That is correct. Uh, the, the question was, our comment was that uh, use the eclipse glasses in front of the camera and that will work to to protect the camera. Yes, uh, there's one of the references in that handout a uh, fellow that does photography and he will tell you how to make a solar filter for a camera like a larger camera, but it would work for any, you know, anything from your cell phone up. Um, and for years we've used uh, aluminized mylar. And it's not certified and it's not whatever and we've used it for telescope filters and everything and it works fine and that's what you have basically in the glasses now they've got a safety standard it goes it has a, a safety standard notation that comes with it the price goes up but we used to be able to get this stuff by the yard and i i have some yet um anyway that's uh that's the caution is is don't let your camera and material get get destroyed. Um, another way to observe is to the, the partial phases is to use a pinhole viewer. Uh, you've probably seen diagrams for these. You can punch a little pinhole in a piece of aluminum foil, put a piece of paper behind it, and you can see an image of the partially eclipsed sun. Uh, you can do that with, with light filtering through a tree was comes through the gaps between the leaves. If you put something down that uh, a white sheet or a white, even just a white piece of paper or a white piece of, of uh, cardboard, and you'll see dozens of little crescent suns showing up there. One of my favorite ways, and I have not seen it advertised anywhere, and I don't know why, and I was going to try to do this, but the sunny days got to me. Um, if you take a, a mirror 
like a makeup mirror, just a small mirror. It can be square. It can be round. It doesn't matter. Reflect the sunlight onto a wall in a building. You can go through windows or the wall on the outside of a building. If it's white or light color, that's best. And you can, if the farther you get from that wall, the bigger the image becomes. It'll also become a little fainter. But I've done this with uh, uh, the school that I was at. We had uh, the uh, annular eclipse in the 90s. I can't remember the year, right? I can't, I don't have it. But we were at the observatory away from the office building, the general office, and the I set the mirror up on a tripod and they had hung a movie screen out on the fire escape on the side of the building. I'm 150 feet, 200 feet away, and the kids in the school here at the observatory are looking out the windows at this movie screen that has the eclipse sun on it for the, the annular eclipse. And it's just ideal. I mean, if you have a crowd of people and you want them to see this eclipse in unison together, even people that don't have glasses can see the partial phase of the eclipse projected that way. So try it. Um, yes. We use a, a shoebox. Yes. Hold for the eye on one side and a pinhole on the other, and it and it catches. Right, and you and you get an image there that you can look at. You've got the lid off the shoebox, so you can look. At, you know, the, so you have to have the lid on. You look at from the end. And it goes okay. The okay, so you've got a viewer at the end. It's going to be a tiny, tiny image, but yeah, that will work. Absolutely. Uh, you can use a toilet paper roll or a paper towel roll would be even better, and put a pinhole and, and something on what, aluminum foil on one end, and use the other end with uh, some, something like Kleenex. Where you could look at it from the backside and you could see the the image on the Kleenex. You can play with it and do all kinds of things. Uh, one of the one of the suggestions and one of the links there is to take a colander and use that to, you know, hundred pinholes. I haven't tried pegboard. I don't know if it would work at the right distance. It probably would too. Okay, what are we looking for during totality? Well, the general shape of the corona. What does it look like? It can be really interesting. It could just be a round kind of corona, but you're looking at a part of the sun we only see during the total eclipse. There are prominence loops and flares. I've already talked about that. Uh, concentrate on the edge that was just uncovered and later the edge that will soon be uncovered. The edge was just, I got that wrong. The edge was just covered and that's where you're gonna see the prominences and the flares. And then the edge that will soon be uncovered again, just before it uncovers, you should see the flares and prominences if they are there. Um, remember, if you're on the center line of the eclipse, you have only about four minutes of totality. And I advise you not to spend time fumbling with the camera, trying to get pictures for three and a half minutes, get some, get some eyeball on the sun and don't let the camera take away from this experience, especially if it's your first. Um, of note, right here, Venus will be 15 degrees west of the sun. You're looking south. West means it to the right of the sun in the sky. You might see a bright dot 15 degrees from the sun. It's pretty close. Okay. A measure for sun, for angle in the sky, hold your fist out at arm's length. People with little fists have shorter arms. People with big fists have longer arms. And it's approximate, but that's 10 degrees from one side of your fist to the other side of your fist. Put them two side by side, that's 20 degrees. And if you did that from the eclipse sun to the west, which will be to the right, if you're looking south, as you will be, then you should see a bright dot out there, which is Venus. You may also find Jupiter, which is going to be 30 degrees east of the sun, three fists east of the sun. And it will be not as bright as Venus is, but still uh, you should be able to see that during the totality. So there's something else to look for. Uh, you can look for rapid sunset 
when that when the eclipse goes total it gets dark very quickly the sky will still be bright but the light level drops just dramatically animals respond to this birds their calls may vary birds may go to roost uh, they they may uh, behave in strange ways. Um, we were in Wyoming in a campground with a pasture nearby. There were trees. It's August. The cows are under the trees in the shade. As the eclipse goes total, every one of those cows got up. Off in a single line they went. <laughs> it was night as far as the cows knew. Louise. Be sure to mention to them all the time. Thanks look for Bailey's beads. Okay, Bailey's beads. Yeah, again, like like the prominences and so forth. Bailey's beads is actually when the sunlight is is filtering through the mountain valleys on the moon. If you you know in in silhouette, uh, you're looking at the edge of the of the moon. There are mountains there. It's not perfectly smooth and there are little valleys between the mountains and that's where the sun will first appear as it uncovers. So that's one of the things you can look for and you need to have your glasses ready for that because uh, you again, that's the first glimmer that you're going to get. There are people that hang out at the edge of the eclipse area because there the moon is sliding by that edge and they get more than just a quick glimpse of Bailey's beads. They look for Bailey's beads. For me, that's too much sacrifice. I'm not doing that. I want to see the real thing. This is a planning timeline. Don't worry about reading it. We're going to go these. Plan your trip. Select possible locations. I've already got three locations. We're going to be up in the Dallas area. I like that because I've got interstate highways. If it's cloudy, it's going to be cloudy. It's a day like today in Dallas. I can take off and go 100 miles one way or the other fairly easily on the interstate highways. Um, decide the routes of travel. How are you going to get there from where you are to where you plan to go and gather, uh, allow plenty, plenty of time for that trip because it may be slow. Gather any special equipment, eat clips with glasses, camera, filters. Okay, that's the plan. Uh, use several sources for weather. The Weather Channel, AccuWeather, on TV, phone apps. I love phone apps. You can actually set the radar, the, or the uh, indication on, on a weather bug. I, I don't use AccuWeather very often. But you can set the maps for radar and you can see where it's raining, storming, so forth. But you can also select a layer just like you do with Google Maps where you, you can get a topo map or you can get a highway map or whatever you want. You can select cloud layer, cloud cover, the, the visible uh, Earth satellite, and it'll show you where the clouds are. So you can use that to, to tell you what when you're hunting for the eclipse itself. Use local forecasts near your intended observing site if you can pick them up, pick them up or get them uh, through a TV connection in an area where, where they are. Uh, watch the long-term forecasts. A month before is not too soon. Goodness knows this this and a storm that we had last week was was almost perfectly covering the whole area in Texas where the eclipse will be. So we want to kind of look at those those long term forecasts a month ahead, a week ahead, and as we get closer to the time, the forecasts become more accurate. So that kind of give you an idea of where to go. We've changed when we went to Wyoming. We were going for Idaho, and there was some smoke reported up there the day before, so we went for Wyoming. And we got a campground. Louise says, I'm going to call and see if we can get a campground. I'm shaking my head. Are you kidding me? Well, she called just as somebody after somebody had canceled out for some reason they weren't going to show. We got their spot and I couldn't believe it. OK, so plan to leave early to get there because you're going to have heavy traffic parking campgrounds, hotels are going to be near capacity. This, if you don't have a reservation already, you can try. Never too late, but uh, it's going to be tough. So that probably finding a spot to park, or park permanently. You're going to if I RV. So if, if I find a place nearby where I park the RV, the car becomes my Eclipse vehicle. 
If you want a local souvenir, buy it early. I forgot to bring my shirt along. I had busy going, but I, I got a Wyoming shirt. It was the only thing that they had uh, left by the time I got to it because that was after the eclipse. Okay, organize your equipment, orient yourself to the directions where you're where you're observing north, south, east, west, know, know where those directions are. Make sure you have a clear view of the sun during the eclipse. It's going to be high for us. It's noon and it's going to be high in the sky. And this is good. It should be easy to pick that out. Um, but you don't want to be real close to trees. You don't want to be real close to a big building in the direction where the, the eclipse, eclipse is going to be. Have your glasses handy, have the camera, tripod, binoculars, any, any other equipment set up and ready to go in advance. So you're ready to take the pictures that you want and don't have to be fumbling with equipment during the totality. When the eclipse ends, and this is a phenomena, we've, we've waited an hour for the moon to cover the sun. The moon has covered the sun and now the sun comes back out. That's oh, all over. Jump in the car. Let's go. And uh, you, you'd be surprised. In, in Paris, we, we were, we rented a car and we had to go outside of, of uh, Paris, out into the countryside. And we had, I think, it was a Michelin map book that's about that thick with all the roads in France. And we were running the back roads trying to get to a spot where there was clear space in the sky. And we found, uh, found the uh, proximate spot roundabout, and I wanted to go a little further that way, took the wrong turn, I'm gonna swing a U-turn. I've done a couple of them already. Swing over onto the shoulder. The shoulder was mud, the car goes into the ditch. So we're observing the eclipse from there. This lovely Belgian couple comes by, speaking perfect English. We'll call you a tow. Thank you. Off they went. About the time the eclipse is going to happen, here comes the tow truck. We had extra glasses. We gave the guys the tow truck. They got to watch the, the eclipse. It went total, and they got to see the total eclipse. And then we hooked the car up, drug it back to the shop. Look through my dictionary, I found where the word lavage was. Lavage means car wash in French. And so we paid them with the last 50 euros that I had in my wallet. That's the bill. There they went. And we went to the car wash and we had some change. So we washed the bud off of the car so we could turn it in, turn in the rental, and we got away with it. But after all that, we get onto the highway. We're on a three-lane highway leading back to Paris, three lanes each direction, and we're at a crawl for an hour. We decided to get off. There was a shopping center somewhere. We're going to get something to eat. So we went in, got a pizza, took it back to the car, drank our champagne, and the pizza got back on the highway another hour and a half, two hours till we got back to Paris. Five minutes. It took longer than that. Okay. So plan to delay your departure until the traffic clears. We had a camper that left in Wyoming, got out on the road. Two hours later, they came back in. They had been out there stuck in traffic, stuck in traffic. They finally got a place where they could turn around and they came back, stayed another night. Okay. So if you're thinking of looking for them, waiting for the next one, this map here shows where the path of all the eclipses from 2041 to 2060. This is the next one for the US right here. That is the next one. And it's going to be up in Montana, western or eastern Montana, western North Dakota. And that's the very end of that eclipse track. Here's another that comes close down here that just misses the tip of Texas. So you'd have to go to Mexico to see this one. And that one is uh, 2052. A few years from now, yes. And there's another one in southern Texas that ends in south Texas. You can see there's one just comes in a little stub right there. So that's those are the next ones. You can wait even longer. September 26th, there will be one in Mexico. That's 2071. 
and May 11, 2078, the center line actually crosses the RGV. So if you're willing to wait 54 years, you can wait for that one. Okay. And that's it. Thank you all very much. Same. And how many It stops right there. You have you partial. You have partial phases. Once the total ends, once total ends, you got partial phases that take as long as they did to get to totality. Uh, but you've seen that show already. That's why people get, you know, very seldom do you have people that really hang around to watch it all the way till its sun comes out completely. Okay. Okay, Kathy. Kathy. Kathy, the drawing, please. Yes. But we have some special, special things. You know what I have for the drawing? Solar glasses. How many are you going to be okay. ready? All of them. Okay, if I don't call your name, you don't get one. <laughs> <laughs> How about Ann? We'll, we'll put over Ann Whitney. Ann Whitney gets one. Oh, I'm going to go around and give it to him. Robert Hernandez gets one. Okay. We don't get one. <laughs> Melissa. Major. I'm a nurse. I had to take care of everybody's eyes. Mary Baker. Raymond Alabama. Lori Archibald, William the Rich. Somebody here. Roberta Allen. Why are you leaving? Oh, you do. That's so good. You've been so. I can see. Mario Canita, welcome back, Mario. Before you leave today, I'm talking, you know, I want to make sure I got everything up to date. Uh, Michelle Medina, she had to leave because her daughter had to practice for first communion. Velma Smith. No. I don't wear the wire driver. Tom Butler. He already has one other day. I've got a few. Cindy McKee. Jennifer R. No. Yeah. Yeah. Anita Westerbelt, Louise Richard. Oh, we have the helpers. You have some? Yeah, I'll help And I'll draw another name. Thank you. Roxanne. Oh, oh, I have them. I bought for my whole class. Okay. And another okay. class. How about John McKee? See if it's see if it's <laughs> Joseph Connors, right here. Thank you. Got a couple of you. Probably don't now. Check those master natural. Hey, River. She called my name. Okay, we're coming up on full money here. Probably every, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Those that the uh, annual. Not really. The class. Six. Yeah, we may have to give one to our guest. The last name in the hat is Maria Pickens. My name is Sherry. It's in hand. Okay, so then we okay. have people that didn't want to want, and including we had some guests here tonight. Any of our students? You know. I want to make sure her. I got one. Yeah. Anybody here didn't get one? Anybody here didn't get one? 
Transfer officially even has our driving line. Thank you, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's get back to the business meeting. No break. No break. You need a break. Okay. I'll give you two two minutes. Two minutes. You know how I am. Hey, you want to get out of here at eight o'clock tonight? I got a long agenda here. Okay, go take a break. Get a treat. Get some of Kathy's boom pies. Is this gonna is this thing gonna go here? Yeah, please. What? Yeah, what did I tell you to do? I said one. Well, yeah, I sent an email. I told you that it, when I asked why they're here, it's different from what. But you look at the minutes and you say no. I no, saying when I ask for approval on the minutes, say, no, the chat, maybe. 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 We are in the Oh, uh, no, I think I was showing the story. I gave Robert a lot of Nick Miles's Yeah. That's what you'll be on at six, but then three. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. I hope we'll see you in the ball. I'm meeting on my trip. That's a business man. Yeah, I hope they're I I forgot to change into English by no, not me. Yeah, 
No, es que hay nombres. No, sí, yo Hay un programa tan que es activo con Morena, ya en la vida se me da Pero ya, Claudia, es la que eso que dije, está bien, bien preparada, bien, es ingeniera, pero Okay, are we ready? Start the business meeting. Hello, hello. We're ready to start. Bye bye. But two two people want to join our class next time we have class. Well, they keep coming to our meetings. Okay. Um, got so many papers up here. Okay, this is the our business um, the business meeting, and we're going to have some reports. First of all, is the minutes of the last meeting, and I already had someone tell me they had a correction. Go ahead, Roxanne. My name is not on there for attendance. Velma, Roxanne's name is not on for her. She wants to be counted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't think they counted me on February either, but I didn't say anything the first time. Did you sign in? Oh. Yeah, that's yeah. why. Because if they're not on the list, they don't sign. That's, that's where I get it from. She gets, when you sign in, she gets the list and she uses that to put the attendance on. Okay. We put it right back in your lap. I did. <laughs> oh, God, you'll you'll have me impeached no. <laughs> before the end of my term. I don't know. No, not, not before the end. No. <laughs> okay. Um, treasurer's report for me. I have to give like three or four people's reports here. Missy, where my treasures? And I just say. We had a good balance. We had a lot of money coming in. We had a little money going out. Let me see. I know it's here someplace. People at home hearing all this. Can they see my face? Thank you. 
Thank you. How'd you get that? <laughs> oh, I sent it? <laughs> Magic. Okay. We had Kathy's going to give a report. She's been calling people like crazy. So we got $120 this month and people paid their dues. That was our income expenses, class expenses. And that's probably uh, when we go visit sites, we get charged. So we pay, and I don't know if that was books and t-shirts, if that was the whole year's. And then one of Donald's legal cases, Trump's lawyer. Okay. So we have a beginning balance sixteen thousand three hundred seventy seven dollars. Okay, after expenses ending balance $15,970 submitted by Gail Rice. Okay. These are all my little pieces of paper. People give me notes all month long. Add this, add that. I don't dare to throw them away. Okay, we'll have our directors. Reports. Now all the reports. We got to do minutes. Treasurer's report. We did that. Velma's minutes. We did that. Robert, you're next. You didn't want to be next. That's why, because you wanted to eat your treat. I didn't hear the reports. The minutes. Yeah. Okay, so we are two, three days away from the Home and Garden Show. Finally. And uh, everything's uh, set up uh, as far as the um, number of. Uh, let's see what's that do with it. There it is. Okay, we had asked for six to eight volunteers per shift starting Friday afternoon. Friday's a short day. That starts at 1.30 and goes through six. We have two shifts uh, going on for volunteers. At that time to man the booths that we have, we have two, like, like I said before, two 10 by 10s where we're going to be uh, talking to people, the people who attend the, the show or the event. Uh, we'll be talking to them about using native plants uh, in their landscapes, in their gardens. Uh, at the same time, we will be talking to them also or giving them information about Texas Master Naturalist uh, program. So we have a shift that goes from 1.30 to 4. There'll be a 30 minute uh, overlap between shifts. That way people can turn uh, the people that are there on the, on the one shift will uh, uh, let the ones that are incoming the information that we already have. So we want six to eight, except Friday. Oh, I thought you had it up there. Except on Friday, we don't need that many because we don't have uh, speakers where we're going to be uh, having a couple of the of the volunteers to support the speakers during when they they, they do their presentations. Saturday we have uh, four shifts: nine thirty to twelve, eleven thirty to two, one thirty to four, and three thirty uh, to six o'clock. Again, we would like to have six to eight. Right now we have anywhere between five and six people per shift. Uh, some have uh, asked me to sign them up for more shifts. I'm going to wait until tomorrow, Tuesday, to get a final tally. And uh, if there are shifts available, then we will input those that want to add an additional shift. And then Sunday, 1030 to 1, 1230 to 3, and 230 to 5. And the 3rd shift, the people that are there on the last shift uh, will help us take down. Oh, whatever we have put up now, Thursday. Will be the delivery of the plant. So if you did pot plants at home, uh, make sure. Uh, is there any persons or people in here that potted plants to take to the ship? Okay. So if you did, uh, you can label them on your own, uh, or wait until you get them there and we'll have labels available. Okay. 
And, and you can deliver those any anytime between 9 and 12. So when you get there to the convention center on the east side of the building, there's a big door where you're going to be able to, if you have a lot of plants, uh, you can drive into the building and uh, so you don't have to carry them uh, that morning. And then in the afternoon, you can't drive in anymore. Okay. So that's Thursday. You deliver the plants and we'll be setting up as well. We'll be setting up the tables, which I will be taking on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I didn't request help because all it is, I'm going to pick up the stuff that we have in storage, tables, uh, the, the, uh, the, the shelves, uh, the carpeting, and all that stuff that we need for the uh, booths. I'll pick those up on Wednesday and deliver them myself. I can drive up in there also. So I will have somebody helping me, of course. Uh, and that is basically it. The schedule for the uh, presenters, we don't have any on Friday. On Saturday, we have uh, Jaime Rodriguez, which is one of our, in our new class. He will do, do be doing at 1130, Buzz and Flutter, be in Butterfly Havens for your garden. That's his presentations. Uh, if you're not volunteering and are, are just going to the, uh, the event itself, please, go out and support our speakers. Okay. That's 1130. Yes. And these will, uh, will, uh, be valid for, uh, advanced training hours. Okay. At, uh, of course there's other presenters in between from the master gardeners and other organizations. At 1.30, we have Anita Westerville with her presentation on Bring On the Hummingbirds. Uh, that's 1.30, and I think it's, what, 45 minutes? Yeah. 45 minutes. Okay. And then at 2.30, we have Jennifer Rectori. She'll be doing better lights and safer nights. Uh, she'll be talking about outdoor lighting effects on health and uh, safety for both humans and wildlife. And then at 3.30, we have, again, Anita Mess. Westerville, I'm sorry, low maintenance, high yield blooms, native plants for small plots. And she will be talking about blooming plants at various times of the years. They provide homeowners with year long beauty and wildlife with a whole gamut of, <laughs> of nourishment, nectar, palm fruit, and seeds, of course. That's Saturday. Sunday, the first one we have is 1230. Again, Anita Westerville will be presented on bring on the hummingbirds. And then at 2.30, uh, again, Anita Westerville will present on low maintenance and high yield blooms. Okay, so at home, those of you that are listening in also, uh, especially our students, if you're lacking advanced training, this is a good time to get them and support our speakers. And at the same time, if you wanna help us out during the event, also just look us up. We'll be on the east side of the building uh, and then the speaker stage will be set up on the uh, right there by the concession stands. I don't know if you're familiar with the convention convention center set up, but that's the way it is. Just that one big area in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Question. Who wanted to attend um, one of the speakers? How do you like? Is there a sign up sheet? How do we know that it's AT? Is it just the honor system or honor system? Yes. Just want to make sure we yeah. have to sign up. No, there will be no sign of this. We will know because we'll be there. Yeah, yeah. No, yes, but and we we honor that. Yes, honor system. Yes, uh, thank you, Joseph. The uh, event is free to the public and also for anybody who goes in. Uh, I think there was one year, the first second year that we started this, they, uh, they were charging because they had I need a, but uh, we had speakers that were like TV personality and stuff like that. So that's when they were charming. No. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, you want to present you here in a minute? Hold on. Is there another question? Okay. Go back up after. Okay, next we've got um, Jennifer is going to come up and talk to us about programs coming up, speakers, second vice president, Jennifer. 
Hi everyone. I want to say thank you to everyone who brought snacks to share tonight. My sun chips and everything else is sitting on my kitchen counter. So I'm glad some other people brought food. I'm very sad about it. Um, so let's see April. We have butterflies. May we have ocelots and June we have foraged foods. So we have some exciting stuff coming up and I hope you will join us at our next three meetings. I'm working on programs for July onward. So if you have ideas, please share them. I'm very excited about our upcoming programs. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Uh, sorry, there was a, I'm sorry. What was your question? Like, okay. they, like I'm going to be. Uh, I wouldn't be home by then. Mm -hmm. Are they online? I mean, can I come and? Uh, so we'll be doing it on yeah. WebEx. But yes, uh, all of our programs will be on WebEx. So if you so just look out for the email and you'd register for the meeting and they will send you a link to to join on WebEx. So we're we're actually streaming on WebEx right now. We have people who are attending online. Seventeen people. Seventeen people. So. But you don't get any foraged foods if you don't come in person. Belma. Uh, it's foraging forests, but it'll be on foraging. Her name just went. She's she's one of our members. Katarina. No. She she did this presentation at Quinta Mazatlan last in the fall. And her name just went poof. Yeah. Yes. That's good enough. Thank Sorry. You. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Ronnie, are you online, Ronnie? Okay. He wouldn't be. He won't be able to answer me. Okay, we're checking. No. No, he's not. Okay. Then next we'll go to awards and recognition. River. River does that, and I am. Reading the names, presenting the awards. Okay, for recertification, where you get your rattlesnake, Western Diamondback rattlesnake pin, Jack Austin, and they're away on a trip. Joseph, yay, congratulations. Um, so. You misspelled my name. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I, that was a test. It was an eye test, Joseph. All right. Okay, then we have. Hold on, we're going to do pictures since you'd like to skip that. Okay, Here, here's your pen, Joseph. Thank you. Okay. Then we have Kathy Tom. Yay, Kathy. You want to turn around? Get my snake. Yeah, your snake. You've been giving them out to people all the end of the year, right? She finally got one for herself. When I was out at the uh, battlefield for their presentation last Saturday, there was a huge rattlesnake curled up right to the side where the people were. Unbelievable. He wanted to show himself. He knew he's a celebrity this year with our chapter. And Zeke, Zeke earned his. He was in com competition with his mother, but guess who won? His mother. She got hers last month. Congratulations. See. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and Anita. She won her rattlesnake. Right, earned all your hours preparing for this uh, weekend, right? The home yeah, garden yeah. show. Hundreds, hundreds. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, 250 hour milestone. We had Tom Nix. He's not, pre he's online. Congratulations, Tom. You want to give Tom a round of applause? Okay, then we have a 500 hour milestone pin and none of these are present, but maybe they're online. Mary Lewandowski, you don't know. Lisa Adam, David Hayner. Okay.
How many minutes do I have? I'm <laughs> saying uh, we have five minutes. <laughs> you don't. So if you know Anne, if you don't know Anne, then you're not a master naturalist because she is all over the place. Therefore, she has attained a grand total of acid tax. When was your class of what? 2017. So it's uh, three, four, five years. Uh, she has accumulated 4,000 hours, volunteer hours. So big round of applause for her. And she has, uh, we have uh, a special presentation. Number one, we have the uh, Dragonfly, thank you, with a ruby encrusted in it. Okay, that's 4,000 hours, guys. Rats. Next thing you have is from the White House, from Washington, signed by Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, what's our president's name? Biden. President Biden. <laughs> president Joe Biden. See right here. I would read it, but it would take too long to do this. Okay. Special presentation. And you have the Lifetime Achievement Award. With grateful recognition, American Corps and the Office of the President of the United States honors and Mayville with the President's Lifetime Achievement Award for the lifelong commitment to building a stronger nation through volunteer service. Again, signed by Joseph R. Biden, Jr. And then lastly, we have a pen, it's a very small print, but it's from the President of the United States for also well, it accompanies the, the certificate. Okay, really nice. Congratulations. John. How long ago did you reach that? Um, and Oh yeah. Uh, November, November, December. That's after the meeting. That's the meeting. November. So the end of October, beginning of November is the time. I have the date, but it's not. Yeah. Not that how many hours have you got since then? Well, <laughs> there is a five. There's a five thousand hour pen. That's what I'm working for this year. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Awesome. So, started on eleven thirteen twenty three. Oh, November. That's when I reached it. Thank you, River. Okay, communication committee. Anita, you have. Do you have anything to tell us, or did Robert cover it all already for this weekend? Okay, thank you. Joseph, you have anything to report? Okay, thank you. Judy, AT director. Is she here tonight? I think she said she couldn't make it, but she's okay. on the next field trip. Okay, she is working on something that I'm impressed with, and I hope it is comes to fruition. Um, she she's made her she's made a request to Santa Margarita Ranch, which because I'm a birder, there are some rare birds up there, and those two too. Um, and she's asked them if we could go to the ranch with no charge. It's ninety dollars a person to visit their ranch. So I don't know if they're, she, how she put it was, and it was very good. She said that um, the city challenge is coming up. Could we come to the ranch and do the city challenge? The members of our chapter? Oh, I hope it's enough to sway them. I don't know. County, I, I, what county is it? Star County. Star County. So, so I'll, I'll try to Okay. So the city nature challenge is at the end of April and we noticed last year that there is almost no observations for Willacy County and Star County. So what we're trying to do is put together field trips for Saturday and Sunday, one in Star County and one in Willacy County so that we as master naturalists can get out there and find observations for those areas. I was at Santa Margarita Ranch last April. I had never been there in the spring when everything is blooming. There are amazing plants out there. So I'm really hoping that if it doesn't work out there, we can find another place to go and take observations because it's a beautiful place. 
I think I paid 50. I think it's gone up. When those rare birds showed up, they upped their price. It's now $90 a person. Okay. Volunteer service projects, river. I didn't forget you this moment. I don't think you forget me again. No. You always forget me. So um, for March, of course, we have the home and garden show coming up and Robert has told you all about that. And so I'm not, that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> Forrest Gump, that's all I'm gonna say about that. The next thing coming up after that is kind of in the works. It's at Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park. It's called Healthy Parks, Healthy People. And what we need is uh, someone from our group to um, they, we need somebody to um, take the initiative and be head of a committee that will come up with an activity for this event at Benson. So I'll be sending out an email about it and hopefully I'll get some response. But if it's not, just bouncy cat. What? Yeah, we can bounce around the traffic. It has to be TMN related. TMN related. Find a green one. You're looking at nature while you're bouncing. April. <laughs> April 13th. Sorry. April 13th from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. So does the activity has to be healthy? Well, usually activity is healthy. So, yes, it's inherent in activity so like this activity uh, will be have others or children? yes yes so it's we have like a booth area or i'm not sure exactly what however we will have children coming through families coming through and it's to promote the state parks and how healthy they can be for you yes if somebody's interested in picking up a little committee, I have a whole sheet on it. I do have that too, but you can take it and run with it. Yeah. No, not me. I got another one with Rachel. I'm doing gym. Any job. other question on the April 13th Benson thing? All right. The next one is also a Benson thing. At uh, Benson State Park, we're going to paint an irrigation pipe. This also is still kind of in the works, and this is uh, April 23rd. So put it on your calendar. If you want to participate in that, let me know. Uh, we need as many people as we can get, I think. But that should be fun. I'm sorry? The 23rd of April. There is no time yet. They're still working on it. The state's going to provide the paint. They have templates. I think there's three they're going to paint because the Girl Scouts have one. The okay, yeah, we, we'll have one. There's several that are painted, but we'll have one. Don't misunderstand. We're not going to do several. We're going to do one. Yes. Yeah. We like paint or artistically paint. What are we cracking? We're, we are going to be provided with some templates if we don't know how to artistically paint. <laughs> Although we do have a few artists in our group, uh, Linda Calderon is one, and she says she would be available and help us out. Can we put a dragonfly on? My suggestion for us. I don't know. We hadn't thought about that, but you have to be on the committee. I can't. I'm doing, <laughs> doing the water thing. I'm doing Velma. The water certification. April twenty third. Yeah. Correct. That's a Tuesday. Correct. I just want to make sure. It's because it's supposed to be Earth Day, an Earth yeah, that's Day thing. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing is the city nature challenge that you all have heard so much about already. Um, I did send out an email that John Brush uh, sent to us requesting or, you know, that we participate with with him at Quinta, but I'm not sure how that exactly works. Maybe you can tell us some more. Yeah, Joseph it's a good a idea to because we'll get the name of our chapter. All we have to do is say yes. 
the if people do it as individuals. You can just go out and take pictures and you put it on iNaturalist and it's uh, the city challenge. It's a, what do you call it, Joseph, a project? What's that called? It's a project. Uh, it's a project. Okay. And then you put it, it goes towards that project and they try and get, do you want to say a little more about that? So I didn't read the email because I know plenty about it. So I just skipped that. So I don't know exactly what he was asking, but um, participating in the challenge anywhere in the valley counts for us and it's good for the valley. Uh, they've found all kinds of interesting stuff in the years past, uh, first records for the state, uh, a lot of endangered things. Uh, there's uh, the list of our uh, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife keeps of the, what was it, the uh, something of interest species, species of special interest, like they're near endangered or they're hard to find, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, conservation concerns. So we get a lot of recording those as important so we can keep track of them, find out where they are, learn what needs to be done. Um, and so this is just a, a good way to practice iNaturalist. Um, some of us go real crazy. I, I do, but uh, I think I had over uh, 500 species uh, several years in a row. Uh, Anita is always up there at the top. We have several other members of both chapters. Uh, and But even if you just do 10 or 20, if every person in the chapter did 10 observations, we double our observations. Uh, so uh, it's just, and the more you do it, the more you learn. All, I've, all the stuff I've learned about spiders and moths and stuff, that's through iNaturalist. Uh, and the City Nature Challenge is what ended up getting me hooked into Master, Texas Master Naturalist. Uh, this, uh, one of them noticed I was going crazy on nine naturalists and said, we better recruit him. <laughs> and I'll talk to my students about it. Hopefully they'll participate. And the other thing is you don't have to know what these things are. You don't have to know what the flower is you're taking a picture of. You don't know, have to know what the bug is or the butterfly. You just take a picture of it, put it on nine naturalist. Somebody will identify it. So you can have fun just taking pictures. You know, is someone going to be uh, teaching iNaturalist to the new student class? Uh, he already did. We had yeah. that already. I posted a YouTube video on our. You posted page. it on your yeah. web page. So how to use iNaturalist. Okay. So there's often there's if you forgot or didn't go get enough from the class or it was last year. There's always uh, trainings. Uh, John Brushill had with the Quinta and there's probably several others around the valley and we'll send out notices when we see those. But the nice thing is yeah. it's YouTube so you can yeah. watch it whenever. And, and that YouTube one that Roxanne sent out it covers things pretty well too. And Cornell has an eBird. How to use eBird. Mm -hmm. That doesn't count. Not, Not for the challenge. That doesn't count for the challenge. No, I'm um, saying if somebody wants. To. Okay, education director, Jim Still in New Zealand. So I'm gonna just make a few comments about the class. We had 27 students that started the class, three dropped. So we have 24 students and they're working hard and they're on target to graduate. We were trying to up our um, numbers. And so Jim and I have been working very hard with the students. So hopefully the graduation is April 11th, it's coming up. There's two classes left, class 11 and 12, I believe. And then they'll be finished. Okay, are we have a class rep, Roxanne Baldusik, you wanna say anything? Um, you have anything to report on the class or the? I mean, we're trying to get more people to post pictures of the field trips and the class and photos and things, and they right. have been getting better at that. Um, there's more people that are signed up on that WhatsApp, which I only created because several people said they didn't want Facebook, they wanted WhatsApp. So that's still out there for, um, especially our Roma trip for people that want a carpool. That's a long drive out there. Well, the, how that works is, and I've asked for information from Nick Morales, and he will get back to me. We drive somewhere and park our cars because he's stopping. He's on the highway. He's stopping to point things out. So you can't have 12 cars in a line going down the highway and all pulling over. So we have to carpool, and that will be explained to the students this week. We have to get it down to like five cars. Well, even if we carpool to the roof point, because yeah. some people are way on the east side and some are right. in the middle. And okay, the we'll talk about that again at class Thursday night. Uh, it's graduating is going to be 
it's going to be over at the Oleander Acres. So we're so we can um, yes like they did. yes cha chapter members are invited along with the students. And is it going to be a potluck? Like a dinner yes, dinner? it'll be potluck. We'll provide them meet the meat. The graduation. Graduation. Oleander Acres. Yeah. Yes. Oleander Acres, April 11th. More information will be coming out. No. No. We're eating dinner. I don't want to eat at seven o'clock. No. Yeah. It'll be. We'll be meeting sometime in the afternoon, late afternoon or whatever. But we're going to have an education committee meeting. Jim's going to call it so we can discuss graduation details. We don't have all those. We just have the date, time, and the place. Uh, Kathy, you want to come up and talk to us about your project, what you've been working on and how hard you've been working to get people back in the fold after COVID hit and we weren't meeting in person. I think people have gotten out of the habit of coming to our regular meetings. Thanks, Anne. I also want to thank Mary Baker, who's been really helping a lot on this project. We had a lot of folks who hadn't paid dues for the last five years, but we've been pretty lenient. Still letting you get our information about meetings and volunteering and you name it. But the state has strict guidelines. Everybody should have paid by January 31st. So at that point in time, on that date, we had roughly 62 people who had really paid their dues aside from all of our trainees. Well, that number has gone way up since Mary and I have been number one calling. We sent a really nice email to everybody saying, you know, you took the time to take our classes to become a naturalist. It wasn't just something to put on your bucket list and then walk away. He says, there's a lot of time and commitment. Plus, you probably have a, a natural desire about the nature and sharing it with people and, and preserving it. So why not say, yes, I'm going to stay active and here's my $15 and maybe you'll see me at some of the meetings. So since then, I'm really happy to report we're now up substantially we, from that 62 base that I told you had been paid. Right now, as of today, we're 75 and three more just spoke with me today saying their money's in the mail. So if we keep that up, plus our trainees, we're up to about 103 active with trainee members, which is fantastic. So if you bump into folks who took the class and aren't doing anything, ask them, well, why? Was that just something you put on your resume to look good, but you don't care about it anymore? Come on, guys, let's stand up for what you believe in. So thank you all for paying your dues and staying active and helping spread the word about Mother Earth. Thank you, Kat. Good job. Yeah, good job is right. Thank you. Okay, I don't think I have any other special announcements. Anybody want to bring anything up before we end the meeting? Okay, our next uh, board meeting will be the 4th. That's anyone's welcome to join and that's online. Uh, general. And it's April 8th. It's April 8th is a general meeting. Uh, what do we got here? It says, but it's not in. Announcements next board meeting March 4th. Oh, where's my calendar? The, the next the next board meeting is April 8th, and then the uh, the next general meeting should be the third. The third, yeah. Okay, the third next Monday of the month. Yes, the third Monday, which is the 15th. Okay, the general meeting will be the 15th, and the board meeting is the 8th. Okay, all right, then the meeting is, oh, River has something. Oh, we're going to have one hour for AT. And point uh, seven five for uh, your volunteer work for attending the general meeting. Okay. Say that again. One hour for AT for Tom Butler. Point seven five, which is three quarters of an hour for the general meeting, which is volunteer hours. Okay. Pardon? Oh, and drive time. Yes, and point seven five in your drive time. And if you help clean up and stuff, that counts too. Yes, we give you 15 minutes if you help put the place back in order. Thank you for attending, and we'll see you next week, next month. Not next week, no, next month. <laughs>